This is the Wheel of Time Spoilers Podcast. Your hosts are Seth Jacobson and Patrick Heiler. Uh, should I start chapter 37? Sounds good to me. Fires in Kyrian, and our symbol is the setting sun. The rising sun. The rising sun. Egwene returned a graceful nod to the respectful bow of the ship's crewman, who padded past her, barefoot, on his way to pull a rope that already seemed taut possibly shifting a trifle the way one of the big square sails set. As he trotted back toward where the round-faced captain stood by the tillerman, he bowed again, and she nodded once more, before returning her attentions to the forested Kyrian shore. Separated from the blue crane by less than twenty spans of water, a village was sliding past, or what had been a village once. Half the houses were only smoldering piles of rubble, with chimneys sticking starkly out of the ruins. On the other houses, doors swung with the wind, and pieces of furniture, bits of clothing and houseware littered the dirt street, tumbled about as if thrown. Nothing living moved in the village except for one half-starved dog that ignored the passing ship as it trotted out of sight behind the toppled walls of what appeared to have been an inn. She could never see such a sight without queasiness settling in her belly, but she tried to maintain a dispassionate serenity she thought an eye I might have. It did not help much. Beyond the village, a thick plume of smoke was rising into the sky, three or four miles off, she estimated. So they're traveling on the river between the border of Kyrian and Andor. Right. And Kyrian on one side is all war-torn ever since Tom killed the king. The river is the border, right? Yes. Yes. And so there are some Andorans who have crossed the border and have, like, secured a few towns on the river. Right. Just because, like, often town time river towns with bridges it's like the same town on both sides yeah and what we're seeing is like smoke rising up from the kyrian inside this was not the first such plume of smoke she had seen since the Aranin began to flow along the border of kyrian nor the first such village at least this time there were no bodies in sight major civil war yeah with the king and the second most powerful man both dead there's really no one with enough power to take the throne, and people are just fighting over it. They're fighting amongst each other, which means that there's virtually no government, which means that there's no forces policing the countryside. So there's brigands and general destruction and chaos. And I feel like that's pretty well known. That It's been a while now that the, the civil war has been raging. There's a lack of grain flowing in. Which right. is a real issue for Kyrianen because they abandoned most of their farms near the spine of the world because of the Aiel War. Elaine talks about it a bit later, but she basically says that who would we sell our surplus grain to? There's no government to sell it to. Right. And none of the houses are powerful enough to distribute it to the people. And so, you know, the implication being that if they were to sell grain to someone in Kyrian now, who at least had the money to buy it, they would probably be feeding an army, right. not feeding the starving populace. people. Yeah, it, It's a frequent issue of providing humanitarian aid to war-torn areas. Oftentimes it's seized by warlords and used to increase their power, their strength, their standing in the country they're in, either by just feeding them themselves and their people or by selling the goods at an extremely inflated price right. to make money. And so, you know, without a force to distribute the supplies, it's very hard to provide humanitarian aid to the poor. I kind of liked noting, as a Gween's kind of looking out at the landscape, that the forest was thinning, ash and leather leaf and black elder giving way to willow and whitewood and water oak and some she did not recognize, which just means that they're moving speedily along the river and the ecology is changing. Sure. So they're moving far enough south now that she's unfamiliar with a bit of the flora. And they're moving really fast because this captain wants to impress the Aes Sedai because yeah. he's a uh, tarval on her. Just flying along this river. Quick note, Egwene is really appreciating not having to wear white. Oh, yeah. She's wearing a brown dress. No, yeah, because now that she's pretending to be an Aes Sedai. So if she was caught, she'd be punished. Yes. I think they're supposed to technically stay in their banded dress as accepted, even outside the tower. Oh yes, I I, I would think so. And they're and not only that, but they're deliberately 
pretending to be Aes Sedai. They're wearing their rings, not wearing the accepted uniform, accepted's uniform, I should say, accepted, accepted's uniform. Kind of what I think of now is pulling a moraine, where, you know, these uh, this ship captain and the sailors look at them, see the ring, they appear to be Aes Sedai, so they just assume, and and the women don't correct them. You may Which, call me Aes Sedai. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not I am Aes Sedai, but... And you can call me you know, that if you want. A polite head nod, yeah. you, you know. <laughs> I also liked that Egwene notes that she's watching the sailors because she doesn't she dislikes not really understanding what's going on on around her so she's just watching what they're doing with the ropes and the orders the captain gives and how she just wants to learn what she can about about it yeah likely excuse rj just wanted to write about sailors (laughs) why do you think they're all sleeping in the same cabin they don't want to be alone they're just afraid i thought it was because they were visiting teleron riyadh and they wanted to be there to like help her out oh yeah i mean that you goes know, along with yeah terms of, like being afraid like it wasn't it wasn't just that they want to sleep in the same room it's that they're actually like experimenting with this terang Rial while they're sleeping they do say they're scared yeah you know they've they've got the black odd jaw they're walking into a trap the captain thinks it's weird but knows better yeah. than to question when he says well really i mean the rooms are open you know i'll just for no extra you can just have the extra space that i have and right. They say, no, 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 we don't want, we want all to be in one room. I'd also like to make a a small comparison. We have these three witches, and I just boil, boil, toil, and trouble. I don't know, I feel like three witches, (laughs) and it becomes a very important part of the Aiel prophecy. These three Aes Sedai wandering in a troubled land on their way to Tyr and the stone. Oh, the heart of the stone. I don't remember that. I take your word for it. That's, That's part of one of the Aiel prophecies. Totally. Nynaeve, Elaine, and Egwene. Avienda. Oh, and Bane and Chiad. Yes. Oh, okay. So, but they meet, they meet three women as well. The other three. That's true. Yeah. Well, they meet a lot of women. They meet that whole group of maidens. Right. Are there more than three? Yes. When I realized it was the chapter that. So we're talking about thirty-seven right now, but yeah. thirty-eight. When they leave the ship, the first thing that happens is Avienda pokes her head out from around a bush or whatever. Right. And I just skimmed the chapter really quick to see what was in it, and I just saw Avienda, Bane, Chiad. I, but I, I, I didn't read it. Right. So there's a, there's a scene where they ask them, where are you going? And I believe Nynaeve says, we're going to Tear and something about the stone. And they're like, oh. And they look at each other. Three Aes Sedai traveling through a troubled land on their way to the heart of the stone. And Nynaeve says, I didn't say we were on the way to the heart of the stone. I didn't say that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Even though they are. You know, Avienda and Bane. It's a very significant look. And that's why they continue to follow them and end up rescuing them from being captured and from the murder all. Yeah. Best and most unassuming warriors in the world. That's lucky. Or providential, perhaps. But that's definitely a prophecy from the wise ones and one of the signs they're looking for with the Karakarn. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, I wanted to ask you what a snowberry and sugarberry were. Oh, I just glazed right over that. The forest was turning low, grassy hills dotted with thickets. Trees that made flowers in the spring had had them. Tiny white blossoms on snowberry and bright red sugarberry. One tree she did not know was covered in round white flowers, bigger than two hands. Hmm. I don't know. So I think bright red sugarberry are strawberries. Could well, but she said, aren't, doesn't she say they're on trees? Mm, cherries. Bright red sugarberry. I mean, I, I like that. That could sounds like a cherry, and snowberry. I don't know. What Tiny that would be. white blossoms on snowberry. Yeah. Uh, and I immediately thought blueberries. Wild blackberry have a white pinkish flower that eventually turns into a red berry. But that's a vine, or a, a cane, I guess you would say, for raspberries. Yeah, and, it, you know, every, everything isn't the same. I, I always have had, like, you know, I think of leather leaf as oak and do a couple other things. But we also know that um, not everything is the same, like peaches are poisonous. True, true, true. But they do have things like tomatoes and corn and, and things like that, and they have yeah. other names for them. And so I was just wondering if we had equivalents. 
And my head cannon is blueberry and I like uh, that. strawberries. Yeah. Even though they're growing on trees instead of in bushes. Anyway, that was a diversion before the meat of the chapter, which are these prophetic dreams that are coming up. I'll read this snippet talking about the Terangrial, the Stone Ring Terangrial. She had tried it every night but two since leaving Tarvalin, and it had not worked the same way twice. Oh, she always found herself in Teleran Riyadh, but the only thing she saw that might have been any use was the heart of the stone again, each time without Sylvie to tell her things. There was certainly nothing about the Black Aja. So, Egwene, with the exception of two nights, has gone every night into Teleran Riyadh and has learned for, like, really nothing new. I assume the other two nights are one when Elaine went and one when Nynaeve went, because right. we know they both did. And she's getting pretty much dreams about the Taviran. She's not getting dreams about the Black Aja. Right. And that's partially just because I think we've heard it described that dreamers tend to pick up those... They tend to dream about Taviran, and when they do dream about right. Taviran, those dreams are almost always prophecies. It makes, it makes sense. It's that they're, well, I was going to say the most relevant, but they're the most influential. I like that. E- e- any of the three boys alone is way more important to the world than the Black Aja. Uh, and by important, I mean influential in it. Sure, the Black Aja is out there doing stuff, but the boys are doing bigger things. Well, and without any of the boys, the last battle is lost. Mm-hmm. And I think really without the girls as well. We've had this discussion before that Nynaeve, Egwene, and Elaine are all essential to the last battle being successful. Yeah. Her own dreams, without the Terangrial, had been filled with images that seemed almost like glimpses of the unseen world, in caps, as she means, the world of dreams. Rand holding a sword that blazed like the sun till she could hardly see that it was a sword. Holding Kalendor. I assume. Rand threatened in a dozen ways. None of them the least bit real. So I think those are the the nightmares that Ishmael is sending after him. I like that. The Murdral, and that's that circle of people who were coming at him. In one dream, he had been on a huge stones board, the black and white stones as big as boulders, and him dodging the monstrous hands that moved them and seemed to try to crush him under them. I went... That made me think... Lanfear and Ishmael both making plays um, at Rand? The only other person I was talking, thinking it might be was Bilal, because we know Bilal's trying to manipulate him as well. That could very well be. Uh, but I'm the black-white symbolism makes me think Ishmael, Lanfear. Yeah, it's sort of perfect, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. I didn't think of it that way. And Egwene feels that it's clear that it's two people, not more or less. Right, right. And that's that's why I say those two in particular, rather than All Forsaken or... Yeah, you know, uh, world events. Exactly, yeah. yeah. She had dreamed of Perrin with a wolf and with a falcon and a hawk and the falcon and the hawk fighting. Well, that's easy. <laughs> <laughs> Perrin, Fael, Berlon. Perrin running from someone deadly and stepping willingly over the edge of a towering cliff while saying, it must be done. I must learn to fly before I reach the bottom. So I think the person he's running from is Ishmael. Yeah. That's the deadly person he's he's fleeing from. That's... It, seems likely yeah i'm willing to take other suggestions on that one i don't think it's it's not specific enough to really nail it down yeah and i but i think that feeds right into the it must be done i must learn to fly before i reach the bottom is him jumping into the world of dreams yes that's what i thought and he doesn't know what he's doing he's just falling and hoping that he learns enough before he hits the floor. And actually, that points me at somebody different. That points me at Slayer. That essentially, Could be. this deadly person, he has to basically learn how to use Teleron Riyadh to take to, to fight Slayer. Yeah. Or it could be him running from Lanfear because she's certainly deadly and he has to learn how to control Teleron Riyadh to overcome her compulsion. I mean, it, you know, it's a very vague... Yeah, it could be about learning how to be a wolf brother, too, Leia's saying. Yeah, or himself and his ability. Yeah. Someone deadly, though, doesn't really make sense. As... There's any number of deadly people yeah. to run from. <laughs> a dream of an Aiel, and she thought that had to do with Perrin, too, but she wasn't sure. Gaul. Definitely Gaul. A dream of men, springing a steel trap, but somehow walking through it without so much as seeing it. This one I had a little trouble with. That's very vague. What trap does Min spring? I think it's Min in the White Tower. I think she is a trigger 
for Elida to figure out the final connections between what's going on. So I think that she basically springs the trap on Suan and then walks out of it. Without seeing the trap closing on Swan. That makes sense. That's my only guess beyond various dangers. Yeah. The the trap of the White Tower is the one I think she's thinking about right now. Because that happens very soon that Suan gets deposed. That seems the most likely. Matt, with dice spinning around him. She felt she knew where that one came from. <laughs> I think she's wrong. It's yes. Because it's his luck, not him gambling. <laughs> Matt being followed by a man who was not there. She figures this out later. Yeah, just at the end of this chapter. A gray man. Right. Matt riding desperately towards something unseen in the distance that he had to reach. Which is them and their rescue. Yeah, probably. I guess just the gray man, you know, we know he fought one and fell off the bridge on top of one. But this makes me think there are other gray men still coming after him. I think so. Yeah. And then Matt and Aludra, the female illuminator. Right, totally. Who he rescued. He's Has he and Tom rescued her in the barn already? And he's gotten the bundle of fireworks? No, because he and Tom just left right. last we saw them. So left, that, just left Tarvalon. So that's going to happen pretty much the next time we run into them because they end up in the barn like really quickly after they leave. Yeah, right. Tarvalon. And Aludra's fleeing Kyrie N. Right. So that should they should intersect in their travels. And there's more. There's, yeah, oh, it's like three paragraphs. It's crazy. <laughs> Men and women breaking out of a cage, then putting on crowns. I know what I think. Who do you think that is? Breaking out of a cage. What cage was broken recently? Oh, the, the Dark friend, the dark One's prison. And putting on crowns? The Forsaken. They're taking over countries. Yeah. One by one. So that's basically, she's prophesizing Ravine, Bilal, all these... Uh, forsaken that are out there taking Masana. over very Masana, yeah, Semarag, you know, they're all out there taking things over. Yeah, I can. There are already more are coming to me that do wear a crown at some point. Oh, totally. A woman playing with puppets, and another dream where the strings on the puppets led to the hands of larger puppets, and their strings led to still greater puppets, on and on until the last strings vanished into unimaginable heights. It's a long series of people manipulating each other. Yeah, and I think that first one is Land Fear, a woman playing with puppets. Mm. And another dream where strings on puppets. So I think there's two separate dreams, right? And so I th- think the first one is talking about how Land Fear is manipulating the girls by giving them the information to Tear and manipulating Rand. And so she, she, and she's manipulating the other Forsaken and Ishmael, you know. Yeah. So I think that's just a dream about Lanfear. Kings dying, queens weeping, battles raging. Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> Literal. White cloaks ravaging the two rivers. So that's Fane influenced white cloaks coming back that parents Also later literal. Fights. Yeah. And then it says her mother and father every night, but I don't know that, that, that that's prophetic. And oh, there's also the Sean Chan, which yeah. I think is the attack uh, on the White Tower. Of the Sean Chan. I think she's even starts dreaming about that very early on. Yeah. And and that's a, actually a persistent dream we see frequently over the book until it happens. Yeah. The next thing I have is Egwene thinking about Nynaeve and Elaine using the stone ring on, on their nights. But we already, we already talked about that. Mm-hmm. Just thought it was sad that she was thinking about how wonderful it would be to see her parents again. She yeah. never does. Yeah. She dies before that. Just to bring you guys down. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's a semi-interesting conversation between Elaine and Egwene where Elaine's saying, like, this is awful as they're going by all this destruction. And Egwene's like, I thought you were enemies with, like, I thought you are you know, the ruling class of Andor were enemies with Kyrie Anne. And you guys Elaine kind for of, centuries. Yeah, Elaine kind of says, yeah, we did. And then the Aiel War happened and uh, Kyrie Anne has never really gotten back on its feet and... We've been selling them cheap grain for the last generation. Basically my entire life. Yeah. Yeah. Your entire life, too. Mm -hmm. And yeah, because there are no farmers that will farm close to the spine of the world anymore because they're afraid of the Aiel. Right. Um, And so the the Kyrian just doesn't have the grain to support its population. And now with a civil war. Gwen has the realization that she saw a gray man in her dream following Matt. There's some interesting relationship stuff here between the three women. I mean, we see, sort of see the dynamic uh, still going on of 
Elaine as sort of the balance between Nynaeve and Egwene as they sort of come to their new power dynamic as all on equal grounds as accepted. Yeah. While at the same time, Nynaeve is older and a little more wise than the other two girls. And, like, I think she actually has a lot of good ideas, and then Egwene just takes the other side to be stubborn. She did, Yeah, there's yeah, there's a lot of that. And the reverse is also true. Kind of battling it out like sisters that have become adults, and, you know, just because one's a few years older, you know, that stops being relevant once you hit, like, your mid-20s. Right. It's a few years. What's a few years? It doesn't know? really matter much. No. And... Especially with power, you know, very soon we see Egwene becomes the authority over Nynaeve. And so this is that, the beginning of that mm-hmm. transition. And it happens slowly and it happens painfully <laughs> for a lot of people. <laughs> oh, I do want to say when they're talking about the Gray Man, uh-huh. they're also assuming that the letter is why the Gray Man would be following Matt. They don't think him significant enough <laughs> to have, be like... It's not for Matt, it's, it's not, the letter. Yeah. <laughs> Where it doesn't matter that he's carrying the letter. They'd be trying to kill him either way. That's a good point. They're like, why would a gray man be after Matt? There's nothing in my letter that could possibly... Ah, oh, it makes no sense. <laughs> <laughs> You're not the center of the world. <laughs> Everyone in the books needs to realize that. The blue crane gave a shuddering lurch, throwing Elaine to the deck and Egwene on top of her. When Egwene struggled to her feet, the shoreline no longer slid by. The vessel had halted, with the bow raised and the deck canted to one side. The sails flapped noisily in the wind. Chin Elisor the captain of the ship, pushed himself to his feet and ran for the bow, leaving the tillerman to rise on his own. You blind worm of a farmer, he roared toward the man in the bow, who was clinging to the rail to keep from falling the rest of the way over. You dirt-grubbing get of a goat. Haven't you been on the river long enough that yet to recognize how the water ruffles over a mud flat? He seized the man on the rail by the shoulders and pulled him back onto the deck, but only to shove him out of the way so he could peer down over the bow himself. If you put a hole in my hull, I will use your guts for caulking. Now, part of the reason that they didn't see it is because it's not a mud flat. Right. Which actually it was interesting. I was looking at the wiki, and, and this is definitely an error in all the Wheel of Time wiki stuff, because it all says they crashed on a mud flat. No, that's not. Well, it's explicitly stated. It's expli- explicitly stated that, oh, it's not a mud flat. It's actually a sunken ship by brigands. Right. So... A group of men purposely sunk a ship in the middle of the river so that a trade craft like this one, with its hold full, hopefully, slams into it, gets stuck, and then it can be boarded and then robbed thoroughly. And a a sunken ship is going to look very different from a mud flat underwater. Right. And so that's why the guy didn't spot it. Anyway, I was just, I was researching this chapter and I was like, guys, no, 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 no. (laughs) Get that fixed. I, ha- I have edited some of while doing research, especially in Watt Wiki. I found quite a few mistakes. And I mean, yes, there there is probably some indication that there's something under the water, but a mud flat's going to look very different than like. I would think. I mean, I don't know enough about sailing. I but don't either. In any case, it wasn't a mud flat. Right. That's all we do know. And then Nynaeve storms off, goes over to the captain. We didn't find out until shortly after, but. Nynaeve says, well, if you're stuck, we're getting off because we don't have time for the ship. <laughs> the captain gets upset and he's like saying, no, 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 like it's dangerous. And Nynaeve's like, I do the same thing. <laughs> a six mile walk is not that big of a deal. Right. Rather than having like a multi-day wait. Yeah. Not knowing how long it'll right. take. And Nynaeve's like, it's only if it's only six miles to the next town where we could get a boat, like that will be much faster. You know, we'll be there in an hour or two. Um, we can get a boat there or continue on in whatever way, you know. If you manage to get free, catch us, we'll get back on. But we don't have time to wait and see. And then they have a choice. They can either go on the safe side for six miles, so, sorry, for 15 miles, or the dangerous side for six. Right. And so they choose to risk the danger, which is just Nynaeve's stubborn hard-headedness here <laughs> to walk the six miles rather than the 15. Yeah. They're like, oh, we haven't seen anybody. It's totally safe. Yet you're not going to see Aiel. Right. You're not going to see brigands. They're not exposing themselves to the river. Whoever's out there doesn't want to be seen. Right. They have a short, the women have a short discussion um, about whether or not they really want to do that. And it seems to be a unanimous yes. They need to hurry. The captain tries to get them to, tries to convince Nynaeve, 
who appears to be the leader amongst them, to, you know, at least go on the safe side of the river. And Nynaeve's like, we're not defenseless. <laughs> of course, the captain just says, well, I, I didn't mean to imply it, but, you know. And there's some pretty explicit conversation between the girls about the, the situation between the three of them. Mm-hmm. That there's this, like, tension between stations. Yeah. If one of you says up, Elaine murmured, the other says down. If you do not stop it, we may not reach Tyr. We will reach Tyr, Egwene said, and sooner, once Nynaeve realizes she is not the wisdom any longer. We are all, she did not say accepted, there were too many men hurrying about, on the same level now. If she said accepted, they'd be like, wait a minute, you said you were I said I. Elaine sighed. <laughs> <laughs> a rowboat ferries them ashore. Egwene goes storming off, and the others have, kind of have to catch her. And I just, I guess one of the things I really love is how well RJ writes immaturity. Yeah, it is well done. <laughs> just petty infighting. You yeah, know? this petty infighting is just like, it's crazy and stupid, and like they have to come a long way to respect each other and be effective and stuff like this. And this doesn't come up in this chapter, but I just keep thinking of that line that we see over and over throughout the series. Like, it doesn't matter how mo- how powerful a channeler is, like a knife in the darkness or an arrow from out of nowhere will still kill you. That's it. You're dead. An arrow through the heart kills anybody. The, the power is not much of a defensive weapon. It's very much an offensive weapon. Right. And And that's how, like, if you can take somebody by surprise... They really don't have any defenses. No. They're all, whereas, like, if you don't take them by surprise, they'll just obliterate you. And that's why they need warders as well and men to go with them because an extra set of eyes can see things sooner and make warnings sooner and slow things down. And, yeah, you know, if nothing else, they're less likely to be attacked by river brigands if they're surrounded by seven big dudes. Sure. Because I think here they're actually knocked unconscious, and the guys don't realize their eyes to die when they take them. I think I think that's right. Yeah. So we'll, we'll get to that in the next chapter. But, you know, they're, they're not taken because their eyes to die. They're taken because they're three vulnerable women walking alone in a war-torn world. Yeah. And then I just have the readout. That was really fast. That's a short chapter. Clumps of trees close along the riverbank soon hid the blue crane. Thick growths of water oak and willow. They did not go through the copses, small as they were, for anything at all might be hiding in the shadows under their branches. A few low bushes grew scattered between the thickets here, close to the river, but they were too sparse to hide a child, much less a brigand, and they were widely spaced. If we do see brigands, Egwene announced, I'm going to defend myself. There is no Amerlin looking over our shoulders here. Nynaeve's mouth thinned. If need be, she told the air in front of her, We can frighten off any brigands the way we did those white cloaks, if we can find no other way. I wish you would not talk of brigands, Elaine said. I would like to reach this village without... A figure in brown and gray rose from behind a bush, standing by itself, almost in front of them. (laughs) Timber, would you tell Patrick that I'm angry at him? (laughs) I'm not speaking to him right now. It's that level of pettiness where I'm like yeah. sitting right in front. They're sitting right in front of each other, and like I'm not talking to you, but I'm going to say this so that you can hear it. Elaine standing in between them, just, <sighs> I'm just so sick of hearing this shit. <laughs> the ultimate diplomat. And of course, they're very lucky that this the figure that rises from behind a a you know low bush is avienda and not Hello, avienda Yay. Yay. <laughs> so yeah we but get to meet we got our introduction in 38 right yeah i mean it's we're, there's not much of an introduction here but this is our first glimpse of one of our another female main characters yeah she turns the supergirls from three to four <laughs> Leia, will you tell him that i think his read-ins and readouts are stupid and uh <laughs> Avienda arrives in the last line. So the next chapter is Avienda, Bane, Shiad, and the Supergirls. <laughs> the wise ones use herbs, I said I, but I had not heard that I said I use them. I use what I use, Nynaeve snapped. <laughs> yeah, this that's where she gets to break her habit of using herbs for the healing, which is great. One of the maidens is injured, I think. Yeah. And then later, Egwene gets her head cracked. Yeah. And she, 
you know, which is sort of a nice redemption side. This is where they sort of embrace working together a little bit. Oh, and we see Nynaeve heal yep. the maiden. I forgot that. And she has to use the herbs for the maiden. Yeah, she needs her herb but, patches. Yeah. yeah, where she like stuffs them in your mouth and is like, okay, you're healed. <laughs> <laughs> but then when she doesn't have them, when Egwene's dying, she breaks through that barrier to save her life. Right. And then she never needs the herbs again. And then I guess they part ways because 38 is, I mean, obviously we'll go through all this mm-hmm. later in the week, but 38 is just the encounter with the maidens. 39 is when they, yeah. they part ways. And... There's an initial encounter and then the maidens follow them when they're captured and rescue them. That's right. Yeah. So there's, there's sort of two separate encounters. So there's mm-hmm. the... The same thing with Ruark as well. A lot of these Aiel, you encounter them once, like with Gaul. Aaron encounters them in the cage, and then they harp ways. Yeah. And they come back together in the stone. Mm-hmm. So it's like all of our main characters end up like making friends with the Aiel before they ever get to the stone, which I think is kind of funny. Oh, yeah. Rand may be the only one that doesn't. But yeah, because he doesn't talk to anybody. Yeah. Kills everyone he encounters. And you tell me he's not nuts. <laughs> He lined up the bodies and made them bow to him. That's very serial killer, you guys. Yeah. Yeah. thing that you found relevant for the recording well and I'm, I'm definitely reading that he starts hearing those Theron early in the shadow rising that sounds right i always thought it was somewhat triggered by calendar probably or it i, I know you're talking about it appears to be that that transition from just like background madness to full-on voice in your head madness but the relevant quote was Somewhere in one of RJ's last few book tours, he said he realized he'd accidentally conducted an interesting social experiment of sorts by testing how crazy he could make Rand before the readers accepted the reality of the situation. Which, of course, means he was a little mad long before RJ got to that point. Yeah. Rand has this voice in his head literally screaming, kill Ashaman, kill, 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 and the majority of readers could argue with straight faces that Rand was perfectly sane. It's just the voices in his head that are crazy. (laughs) It's almost as if we were vicariously insane with Rand whenever reading from his POV. And that was posted by David H. You're proud of often we say taint and don't giggle. You know, it's funny because (laughs) I I will admit that, like, at at a point in my life, I I did giggle at that. But, you know, I was reading The Wheel of Time and the about the Dark One's taint long before I ever realized taint was a word referring to the uh, area between the butthole and everything else. I, mean, it, I think it's a childhood thing. Like, taint to me has always meant the Dark One's taint on the one power, not the dirty word that people use yeah. in social context. No, I feel the same. When someone says it, I immediately think of Rand and the Dark One. Right, right. My... <laughs> and then I'm like, right, there's a secondary meaning. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Which for most people is the primary meaning. Right. <laughs> The true test of a Wheel of Timer is do they giggle at the Dark One's taint? <laughs> if you can talk about it and your first thought literally goes to, ew, disgusting, not because it's <laughs> a part of your body, but because it's something that's tainted the one power. Thank you for listening to the Wheel of Time Spoilers podcast. Rate us in the Apple Podcast app or support us on Patreon. Is that good enough?